Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. So our next speaker is looking at dialysis decision making and the experience of BAME patients. Welcome, Dr. Kerry Rosenberg. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kerry Rosenberg. I'm a renal registrar at the Royal Free Hospital in North London and have an academic appointment with the University College London. I'm going to be talking today about dialysis decision making in elderly patients with advanced chronic kidney disease and particularly amongst those from ethnic minority groups. So I'm going to be starting by talking a little bit about the diversity of our UK renal population. So these numbers are taken from the UK Renal Registry Report, which was published last year and covers data up until the end of 2019. So as of the 31st of December 2019, there were just over 68,000 patients receiving renal replacement therapy for end stage kidney disease in the UK. Of those 13% were Asian, 8% were Black and 3.1% came from other ethnic minority groups. Of course, there's lots of geographic variation. So in our London centres, and particularly at the Royal Free, 22% um, of our population are Asian, 22% are Black, and 10% come from other ethnic minority groups. And those percentages are pretty similar across the London centres, so quite a lot more diverse. What's particularly important to mention is that we know we've got good evidence that our Black and Asian patients are at increased risk, both of progression of their kidney disease and of development of end-stage kidney disease and needing to start dialysis. So given that we know that our ethnic minority patients are overrepresented in the population, it's no wonder that there's growing interest and concern both from clinicians and from researchers um, as to addressing health inequalities in the population and what might be able to be done about that. Health inequalities in general are becoming more prevalent in the public consciousness, and that's mainly because they've generated lots of media attention recently. These are just a few examples, but these are all headlines which have been in The Guardian and The New York Times over the last 18 months or so, addressing this question about racial inequality in healthcare all over the world. And it's not just amongst the media that these conversations are happening. It's been at the forefront of the minds of health researchers as well. So this quote is taken from a review article that was published in BMC Nephrology back in 2019. This group of researchers looked particularly at kidney patients and the whole kidney patient journey, and they sought to collate all of the information, all of the research that we have about health inequalities in kidney care. This report, this quote is included in their conclusion. And I think it's really important because it highlights that there's a number of points in the kidney patient journey from access to kidney, kidney clinics, transplants, care on dialysis, where there are health inequalities. And that means there are lots of targets for research that could drive both practice change and policy change. Now, the bit of the kidney patient journey that I'm particularly interested in is something called supportive kidney care. And depending on where you're looked after, you may have heard this re referred to as conservative care or perhaps as maximal conservative management. That all means the same thing, just different terms. Supportive care is defined as a planned and holistic approach to the treatment of end stage kidney disease. It includes things like psychosocial support and advanced care planning, as well as the active management of the symptoms and complications of kidney disease, but without dialysis. So why is this important? There's been quite a lot of work that's gone into supportive care in the last few years, and these numbers are taken from a systematic review that was published last year, 2021. They included all of the current papers looking at survival for patients on dialysis versus survival for those who chose a supportive care or conservative care pathway. And the mean age of the patients included in all these studies was 60 to 92, so a reasonable range. What they found was that for older patients starting on dialysis, the survival benefit was actually quite small. 73% were alive at one year on dialysis versus 71% who chose conservative care. Now, it's important to say that in the second year, this disparity rose quite a lot. So at year two, 62% of those choosing dialysis will still be alive versus 44% for those choosing conservative care. 
And remembering that we're talking particularly about older patients here. Now, what's key to understanding these, this data is that for those patients who are more frail, who have more health problems, this small survival benefit is actually substantially reduced. In addition to that, we know both anecdotally from our patient's experience and from a body of evidence, that dialysis can be a burdensome treatment. And so effective quality of life is an important part to that decision as to what treatment pathway a patient's going to have. So all of that's to say that for some patients, supportive care may offer a treatment option that's better placed to serve the values and priorities that are important for that particular person. Now, we know that dialysis decision making is complex. There are patient, clinician and systems related factors all in an interplay. And it's a balance between what's medically advisable and what's important to that particular patient. These are complex, nuanced discussions. There's been a fair amount of work that's gone into looking at, uh, looking at things like shared decision making and what people prioritise when they make their treatment decisions. But actually work looking at the particular experience of our ethnic minority patients is missing and there's a real gap in our knowledge. So looking at what we know so far, as I said before, there's a real gap in our knowledge when it comes to looking particularly at dialysis decision making and even more so when it comes to looking at those decisions in our ethnic minority patients. There's some work in the US, small qualitative studies mainly, which has looked at things like advanced care planning and access to palliative care and things like dialysis withdrawal. But the question of whether people choose to have dialysis or not is something that's missing. And again, these are all the American studies that may be less relevant to us here in the UK. But there are some important themes that have come out of that work that we may be able to extrapolate to the question of dialysis decision making. So coming to the slide then, on the right hand side is a study uh, from 2018, which looked at just over a million dialysis patients in America um, and their choices. What they found was that in comparison to white patients, patients from ethnic minority groups were less likely to discontinue dialysis at end of life. They were less likely to die in a hospice setting and they were less likely to die in a non-hospital setting, for example, at home or in a nursing home. And this was true for the minority patients as a whole, as well as for individual groups. Also, this difference persisted after adjusting for other factors like income level, age of the patients and the type of insurance they had. On the right of your screen, you've got um, an older paper. This is from 2010, so it's a little while ago, but I still think it's relevant. Um, and this is a piece of qualitative research. It included 61 patients, again, dialysis patients from a US centre. And what the researchers did was ask them if they would hypothetically consider stopping dialysis in a number of different health states. For example, if they had a stroke, if they were diagnosed with dementia um, or if they were in a coma. And what they found was persistently black patients were less likely to support stopping dialysis, regardless of health state. Again, this persisted after adjustment for other factors like age, level of education and comorbidities. So what we can see here is a clear difference in perspective, as well as an access to robust palliative care planning. But what we can't begin to understand from these studies is why these differences exist. Just skip ahead a little bit um, and talk a little bit more about some of the studies that have been done so far. Again, looking at small qualitative studies and with the caveat that these have all been done in a US based population and didn't include any patients who were non English speaking. So looking at a very particular subset. There's a paper in Jason in 2021, which performed structured interviews with both patients, caregivers and their doctors and found that amongst clinicians, there was a discomfort and a reticence to initiate advanced care planning discussions with patients from ethnic minority groups. And when asked about why that was, they cited feeling that they assumed that those patients would take offence or not want to engage in those conversations. And there were also additional communications and cultural barriers which hindered those conversations. This is borne out in a larger piece of work which looked at 5.2 million inpatient admissions for people with a diagnosis of kidney disease. 
So this could be admission for another reason, but with a coexisting diagnosis of a kidney problem. And what they found was that ethnic minority patients were consistently less likely to be referred for a palliative care review during their time in hospital than their uh, counterpart, their white counterparts. So looking at all of this, it's in no way meant to cast judgment on the preference to continue treatment or the preference for more aggressive treatment. But there's certainly a difference in perspective, and I think that's an interesting thing to explore. What I think we don't understand is whether that is just personal preference, whether it reflects a cultural belief, a religious belief, or whether it reflects a distrust in the medical community that means people are, feel unable to access those services. Or are we as medics not providing those more vulnerable groups with the information and the options that they need to make treatment decisions? All of that to say, from the work we've got so far, I think we could hypothesise that access to supportive care would be more challenging for patients from ethnic minority groups, and their conversations about whether to have dialysis or not may be more complex and more challenging. This brings me on to my work at the Royal Free, so looking at our local population here in North London. Um, and I set out to do four things with this work. The first was to describe the social and clinical demographics of a group of patients with advanced kidney disease as it related to what they chose as treatment. Secondly, to take those factors and to identify the predictors for who would want to have a supportive care treatment pathway. I then went on to look at the time taken to reach a treatment decision. And I want to talk a little bit about why this outcome was taken. So obviously to taking time to make a decision for anything, whether it be for supportive care or else, is not necessarily a bad thing. However, it may be a useful marker of how challenging that conversation is, how much deliberation is needed to come to a conclusion. And actually, when it comes to choosing to have a supportive care pathway, for some patients for whom dialysis might be medically inadvisable, those people who are more unwell and more frail, actually making a decision timelessly might be really important. Because as we've said before, supportive care pathways offer this extra bubble of support from people like palliative care nurses and home support that might be really important for someone who's in their final months of life. And so we want to get them onto that as quickly as possible. Finally, I wanted to look at the success, quote unquote, of treatment decision making amongst this group of elderly patients. And that's a really difficult, if not impossible, thing to measure because what's the right decision for one person is not going to be the right one for another one. It's extremely personal, and a large part of that is driven by what's important to that particular patient. What we can measure, though, are objectively poor clinical outcomes that may tell us something about how that treatment decision has worked for that patient, whether it's truly serving them. And I'll come to talk a little bit more about that shortly. So, Moving on to how this project was, was carried out. Data was pulled from the electronic patient record at the Royal Free. I included all patients over 65 years of age who had a new low clearance or supportive care modality recorded in their records between the 1st of January 2015 and the 31st of December 2019. So a five year period, particularly stopped in 2019, because as we all remember, clinics and care pathways were disrupted in 2020. Data was collected for each of those patients. This included their age, sex and the cause of their renal disease and then their comorbidities. The ones we focused on particularly were a diagnosis of cancer, dementia, cardiovascular disease or diabetes. Um, we then recorded ethnic groups for each patient um, and recorded IMD deciles. So IMD stands for um, Index of Multiple Deprivations. It's a measure of social deprivation. Every postcode in the UK will be assigned to one of 10 deciles. The most wealthy affluent postcodes in the country are decile 10. The most socially deprived are in decile 1. So from each person's postcode, we were able to generate an IMD decile, and that was used as a marker of socioeconomic status. 
I then recorded whether patients use an interpreter or not. That could be informally with family members uh, interpreting in uh, consultations or formally via the interpretation service. Um, and finally, whether they uh, reported a religious affiliation in their notes or not. We also reported frailty scores at baseline on entrance into low clearance as and as they changed over time. So this is something called the Rockwood Clinical Frailty Scale. It's used internationally. The score is assigned by the clinician when they meet the patient, and it's an objective marker of how frail that particular person is. Finally, we included GFR, or percentage of kidney function, as it changed over time. All of these patients were then divided into four groups according to their outcome in the low clearance clinic. So lots of numbers in the slide, but I'm going to pull you towards some, some key things. There were 1,768 patients included in the study, so a good number. And as I say, they were divided into four groups. So those who chose supportive care, it's 515 patients. Those who chose to have kidney replacement therapy, so received a transplant or started dialysis, 309 patients. Those who died before treatment decision was made, that's 189 patients, and those who remained in the low clearance clinic or were discharged, and that's mainly people whose kidney function was stable and no further action was needed. And then we looked at the demographics of these four groups, which is those descriptive statistics I was talking about. As we can see, the supportive care group tended to be older than those who chose dialysis, which is expected, mean age of 82 versus 73. More female patients chose supportive care versus kidney replacement therapy. More males chose to have kidney replacement therapy, uh, which was actually an expected outcome. When it came to ethnicity, 29% of white patients chose supportive care versus 24% of black patients and 28% of South Asians. Looking at the raw numbers, it looks like there's a smaller percentage of black patients who are choosing supportive care, but actually that probably reflects they are a slightly younger demographic um, and overall their mean age was slightly lower than those um, in the, the white patient group. And finally, coming to IMD decile, again, the supportive care group have a slightly higher IMD decile, slightly less deprived with an IMD of 5.3 versus 4.9 in the kidney replacement therapy group. Um, but actually, the statistical significant, the statistical difference between those groups was not significant. Moving on to a few more numbers, as expected, those who chose supportive care tended to be more frail than those who chose kidney replacement therapy. Um, and there was no statistically significant difference between the groups as to who was religious or who used an interpreter. Our second goal was to identify factors that were predictive for choosing supportive care. So for this, I used a logistic regression model. What that means is that each exposure, for example, ethnicity, IMD decile, frailty score, were modeled against age, sex, and comorbidities to give a, a chance of how much that would cause you to choose supportive care. So there's the suggestion looking at the raw numbers that fewer black patients chose supportive care, but actually that normalized completely with age and probably just reflects the fact that the black patients were slightly younger than their counterparts in the white group. IMD decile, whether people used an interpreter or not, and whether they had a religious affiliation or not, actually made no difference to what they chose. So what did make a difference? The major predictor for who chose supportive care and who didn't were really clinical factors rather than socioeconomic, and they were age, frailty score, and dementia. So those who were older, had higher frailty scores, or a diagnosis of dementia, were more likely to choose supportive care than anyone else. And that's, an, again, not an unexpected outcome. What is unexpected, I think, is that ethnicity and IMD decile had no effect. So moving on then to time taken to make a decision to have supportive care. For this, we used Cox regression model. Um, who chose, who made decisions more quickly? Again, it was clinical factors, older patients, those with higher frailty scores, those with the diagnosis of cardiovascular disease or dementia, all made a decision more quickly than other people. When it came to ethnicities, the only real difference we saw was in that group of other ethnic minorities who tended to make decisions more quickly. 
Now, that's a difficult thing to interpret because that group in itself is so heterogeneous. There's patients from lots and lots of different backgrounds. Um, within the other groups, ethnicity made no difference to what they chose. Male patients tended to make decisions more slowly. Um, they were also much less likely to choose supportive care at all. And that's actually not a surprising finding that's borne out in lots of the palliative care literature, um, which suggests that female patients are more likely to choose conservative treatment over more aggressive treatment. IMD decile made no difference, the time taken to reach decision, um, and likewise religion and interpreters made no difference. Moving on to the final part of this, which was looking at markers for an unsuccessful or challenging decision making process. As I said before, that's a really difficult thing to measure, which is why we we're looking at objective clinical outcomes that may demonstrate that a certain treatment decision is not best serving that particular patient or that the decision process has been challenging. So the first thing we looked at were risk factors for dying in the low clearance clinic before a decision was made or within three months of starting dialysis. Now, the first part of that was, was chosen because the, well, the rationale for it was that if you are someone who is frail, elderly, lots of medical comorbidities, who is in the low clearance service, perhaps someone for whom dialysis is not medically advisable, someone who's approaching the final months of their life, we want that patient to be counselled to make a decision that's right for them and to start a supportive care pathway as quickly as possible, or if dialysis is important for them, to commit to that. But what we don't want um, it is that person dying in the low clearance clinic without the extra bubble of support that's offered by a supportive care pathway. The second part of that, dying within three months of starting dialysis, is a bit more intuitive. Of course, we want our patients who start renal replacement therapy to do well. We wanted to improve their quality of life. Um, dying within three months of starting is not ideal. So this graph just shows the effect of ethnicity on that outcome. And as you can see, there's very little difference between the groups. And actually, ethnicity was not a factor, um, and neither was IMD decile. Again, the factors that affect this are those clinical things, age, frailty, and comorbidities. Which brings me to the final part of this, which is again a measure of the success of treatment decision making. For this, we used time spent in a hospital as a marker of increasing morbidity and frailty. So what we did was look at emergency admissions only, but time spent in hospital in each of the three groups. So those in supportive care, those in kidney replacement therapy, and those still in the low clearance clinic. Those with supportive care pathway spend much less time in hospital than anyone else. That makes sense. That is the point of supportive care. Those in kidney replacement therapy spend more time in hospital than anyone else. The interesting bit was looking at the effect of ethnicity in each of those, group, those groups, and actually that had no effect on the time spent in hospital with whatever you chose. However, patients from lower IMD deciles spent more time in hospital once started on dialysis. And this was not true in the supportive care or low clearance groups. So that might tell us something about the morbidity of those lower socioeconomic groups, those patients when they start on dialysis. And it might suggest something about their suitability for the treatment and the decision making they've been through. Finally, coming to a few conclusions. The factors associated with choosing supportive care and the time taken to make that decision are in fact clinical rather than socioeconomic, which I think was an unexpected finding for us. What we can say from this population, at least, and it may not be generalizable, that, eth that ethnicity was not a risk factor for unsuccessful decision making or poor outcomes once established on kidney replacement therapy. However, there is that suggestion that lower socioeconomic status may be associated with increased morbidity in patients established on kidney replacement therapy. And that brings us to a really important conclusion that ethnicity can't be viewed in a vacuum. It's about the wider socioeconomic context, social deprivation, who the patient lives with, and their home set up, education, religious and cultural beliefs, 
all of those factors that make a person who they are and define the choices they may make and what's important to them. The study is important because it's the first of its kind to look specifically at dialysis decision making in a UK based cohort and specifically to focus on the socioeconomic factors that may affect those outcomes. It's a fairly large cohort and certainly adds to the data in that way. However, it's important to say that it's limited by its retrospective design, which means looking back in time. And it's also important to say this is a single centre study which took place within a tertiary centre in a very diverse urban community. And it's certainly not generalisable to the UK as a whole or to or internationally. So what's needed really to add to our knowledge? And I don't think we've answered this question yet of dialysis decision making in our ethnic minority patients is multi centre or national data looking at who has supportive care, what the barriers to access are, um, and those markers of challenging decision making on a much larger scale. I think the next thing to say is that, as I've said time and time again over the course of the last 30 minutes, is that this is complex and, and a nuanced discussion between patient and doctor. And therefore, the patient experience really has to be front of mind. So having said all of that, and I, I'm hoping to take this work further, I'm hoping to take it towards a PhD. And what that will involve is that big data section looking at what happens to patients across the country in their dialysis decision making journey. But also what I'd like to do is look at a smaller, more focused piece of qualitative work, which looks at the patient experience of those now more vulnerable patient groups, those in ethnic minorities, those from lower socioeconomic groups, those who don't speak English and what their experience is like. Ryan, I'd like to finish just by thanking my supervisors at the Royal Free. It's Ben Kaplan and Anya Burns. I've left my email address there. That's my UCL email. Um, I'd be delighted to hear from any patients who would like to discuss further, have any questions, um, or would like to be involved in conversations in the future. Um, and I hope there'll be some questions and comments. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you very much, Kerry. Um, we just have one question, actually. Um, do you know about the availability um, and supportive care programmes for ESKD patients? Thank you. That yeah, so end stage kidney disease. Um, yeah, so that, that's really what supportive care is. It's, it's providing, as I said, treatment for those patients who have a diagnosis of end stage kidney disease who would otherwise have dialysis, but for whom it is either not in line with what they personally want to have or not medically advisable. Um, but all renal units around the country will offer supportive care um, and there will be availability, the, the sort of um, the setup the resources available, whether they are specialist nurses and that sort of thing, will vary by units. Um, but it is becoming more and more of a focus um, across the country. Um, and particularly here in London, there is now a supportive care working group um, looking to make sure that we standardise treatment for those patients um, and, and help people to access that. Thank you very much for your time today.